Classified U.S. documents showing Ukraine's military capabilities were leaked and a high-profile assassination took place in Russia both in the last few days. First to the leak. It's hard to understate how sensitive some of this data was that spread across social media and the damage it could do to the Ukrainian war effort, unless, of course, it's a deception and it's all part of the plan. We'll take a look at that. But first, the New York Times reported on April 6th that documents began to appear on social media showing plans for training Ukrainian forces ahead of their expected spring offensive. The plan supposedly included detailed charts about weapons deliveries, unit strength, ammunition consumption, and casualty figures for both sides. That's huge. I mean, for a military planner to know, and I'm making these numbers up as an example, that an opposing force has five brigades of 2,000 troops, 200 tanks, and 700 armored vehicles preparing for an attack, that's really, really valuable. For starters, it removes the question of if those forces exist in the first place. I mean, a surefire way to be caught off guard is when you think your opponent has no reserves and a 10,000-strong force comes smashing against your lines. So at baseline, it would give Russia an idea of what Ukraine is holding back in preparation for an attack but it would also allow an enemy to recognize the phase of an attack as it happens. For instance, if an attack came with 3,000 men, Russia could have believed that was all Ukraine had and begun potential counteroffensives. But now, recognizing the size of the force is larger, using my made-up numbers above, they can wait until they see all or most of those deployed before making decisions on the battlefield. Then the weapons delivery piece is just as important, if not more so. I know these announcements are always public, but they're at a pretty high level. Sometimes we take announcements of intent to send or even plan to send as being in Ukrainian hands right away. Technically, it's possible that Ukraine's partners actually provide that equipment, then announce it publicly. But I think it's more likely that there's a gap between announcement and arrival in country, especially for some of the larger gear. And that timetable of arrival is something Russia would be very, very interested in. I mean, that's tapping directly into your adversary's supply line and projecting out their capabilities. There's a reason that type of information is usually pretty close held. Now, when it comes to ammunition expenditure, specifically of Western-provided equipment, that opens another door of what to expect in the coming months. So it's hard for us, sitting here with just little pieces of public information, to make much of it, but understanding an adversary's rate of fire along with timeline of weapons deliveries, it's a pretty valuable piece of intel. Then there's the casualty figures. Now, the way this was reported was that Russia took that piece of data and flexed the numbers a bit to show a higher Ukrainian figure and a lower one for Russia. Think about that real quick. Leaked documents that aren't confirmed as authentic, then Russia is called out for changing those not yet confirmed authentic numbers. Anyways, I'm not doubting that Russia made some of these adjustments, just the whole thing kind of sounds ridiculous. But either way, that information has been one of the more heated debates throughout this entire war. Each side puts out their estimated casualties for the other, and we are left wondering just how accurate or inaccurate they are. Random note, not going to go too far down the rabbit hole here, but I saw a Twitter thread a few weeks ago where an American was criticizing the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense for drastic underreporting of Russian casualties. Not usually something I hear, so had to check that one out. The person ran through this long analysis of how Russian casualties were likely north of 1 million. Of course, I went right to the comment section to see people tearing into that, but I was wrong. Lots of great assessment, and I agree this is spot on, stuff like that. So I'm not exactly on board with 1 million plus Russian casualties. Seems a little bit high, but bringing that up as just one of the extreme examples of how these counts can be all over the place. And when looking at that data, we have to wonder just how accurate and confident each side is with their own projections. Are the figures actually being used for military planning purposes, or are they designed as more of a means of garnering and maintaining public support? Needless to say, if exact or near-exact casualty figures of an opponent are made clear during a war, that's a big piece of the puzzle in how to plan going forward. Now onto the other theories out there about what actually happened here. So first, I have to bring up the concept that nothing is leaked accidentally. This is a really big one in the political arena, like here in the United States, where things will be randomly leaked to sort of help strategically shape a topic. I'm not fully convinced that's the case here. Not saying that would never happen. I mean, it has before. Just I don't know what's accomplished by doing that. This is very serious information that, if accurate, could alter the outcome of the war, which means it's not usually something thrown around to make a point. If the U.S. was trying to get one side or the other to change a policy or direction, there's likely less critical documents and conversations that could have accidentally made their way into the public domain. 
The other argument that I think is the most interesting one here is the idea that this is a potential deception, which is nothing new for the military to try to throw off their opponent before some sort of major operation. One of my favorites here is Operation Mincemeat from World War II. This one was put together, Mincemeat, by Lieutenant Commander Ian Fleming of British Naval Intelligence. And yes, it's the same Ian Fleming behind the James Bond series. Long story short, Fleming came up with the idea to plant false documents on a body that would convince the Germans that an Allied invasion was coming in Greece rather than Sicily. So it's a story worth looking up on its own. But you can see the similarities here. In World War II, Fleming had to create an identity for the man, add ID cards to his person, and dump the body where it would be found by the right people, but wouldn't be too obvious. They chose to go off the coast of Spain, who at the time was cooperating with Nazi Germany. Body was found by fishermen, turned over to German intelligence, and next thing you know, German reinforcements are being sent to Greece. And some of those reinforcements came directly from Sicily, where the Allies would land in early July 1943. It's not really worth our time here to try to dissect what could be fact or fiction in these leaked plans. I mean, I haven't seen the actual documents, and with anything like this, there has to be some fact to keep the fiction believable. In fact, this is probably a challenge for Russia right now, trying to discern if this information is accurate or a plant. Just real quick, think about the headaches that causes. The Russians think they have top secret information that could alter the fight, but then they have to consider, did the U.S. want them to find it? And if they did, why? That's the sort of challenge Russia's going to have with this information, having to figure out if they act on it, or if doing so would play right into the U.S. and Ukraine's plans. Now, while we're not yet sure if those leaked plans are real, the high-profile assassination in Russia on Sunday is very much real. Russian military blogger Vladin Tatarsky was killed in a bomb blast in St. Petersburg, Russia on Sunday, April 2nd. Before diving into what happened and some of the accusations being made, which I think are really interesting, a little bit of background here. Tatarsky, whose real name is Maxim Fomin, ran a Telegram channel with over 560,000 followers focused on the war in Ukraine. While overall supportive of the war, Tatarsky was pretty critical of Russian military and political leadership in terms of how the war was being executed. And in quite a few cases, he proposed being more brutal and more destructive to accomplish Russia's goals. As an example, in an event last fall, he said, quote, We'll conquer everyone, we'll kill everyone, we'll loot whatever we need to, and everything will be just as we like it. Now, the background here is important because he's presented himself as critical of Russia, but he's not necessarily anti-war. I mean, if anything, he's pro-war and upset that Russian leadership isn't going further than they currently are. Okay, so with that, let's move on to the attack. On Sunday, April 2nd, Tatarsky was speaking at an event when a bomb detonated, killing him and wounding at least 30 others in the crowd. Here's a short clip where Tatarsky was presented a small statue of himself, where Russian authorities later say that 200 grams of TNT were hidden and detonated just a few minutes after this recording. So let's get into some of the more confusing aspects here. First off, the cafe where this took place was owned by Yevgeny Prigozhin. Prigozhin is the leader of the Russian Wagner Group and has come to blows a few times with Russian military leadership over the course of the last few months. And Prigozhin has already confirmed that he'd allowed the Russian nationalist group Cyberfront Z, who organized the event, to use his space. Now, Russia pretty quickly apprehended a suspect, Darya Trepova, who's supposedly a supporter of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Russia has also claimed that this attack was planned and coordinated from within Ukraine, suggesting a strong tie directly to Ukrainian leadership. Now, Trepova is on camera admitting to bringing the statue to the event, which, keep in mind, was likely a comment made under duress, but I've not yet seen any additional details from Russian media on actual ties back to Ukraine. I'll throw out some of the other theories here, but I'm not yet convinced that Ukraine was the mastermind behind this attack. I mean, I'm sure Tatarsky had some enemies in Ukraine, but he doesn't really raise the level of someone worth targeting with assassination inside of Russia. What I mean is his death changes up the information space briefly. I mean, there are plenty of others just like him, but it doesn't really alter the actual war in any material way. If anything, it kind of comes across more of an emotional attack than strategic. Put another way, for the Ukrainian government to be directly behind this seems to be high risk, low reward. All right, so that's the Russian explanation. Let's get into some other arguments about what might be going on. And it's worth noting right now, April 7, 2023, that the truth is far from certain. We're too close to the event, and there's a lot of information that has yet to come out. Ukrainian presidential advisor Podolyak said that this was the product of an internal political fight pointing the finger right back at Russia. My read on that is a suggestion that it could be a shot across the bow from the FSB or Putin directed at Prigozhin. I don't doubt that there's some bad blood there right now, but I'm not convinced that's exactly the case here. 
Russia's jailed anti-war protesters, but have really let these mill bloggers pretty much say whatever they want from the start. I mean, Tatarsky was all in on this war and speaking to a group of essentially like-minded people. It just seems reckless or not thought out to target someone in a setting that could have killed some of your supporters just to try to send a message. That plays a bit into the topic of Russia trying to rile up the domestic audience to show the threat that Ukraine poses to all of them. The idea that Ukraine is a terrorist state on their border, able and willing to carry out attacks inside of Russia. So now we're kind of dabbling into the idea of a false flag attack. Again, not really out of the realm of possibility for this type of event to happen, but that likely could have been attempted without targeting Russia's own base of support. I mean, wouldn't an attack on a random cafe, one without a crowd of ardent war supporters, then pinned on Ukraine kind of meet the same objective? Finally, I do think this will be a bit of a test here in the United States and for NATO. How do we feel about assassinations and targeting of civilians off the battlefield? I know some folks will get angry with that description, but for all the hate Tatarsky threw out into the world, in terms of how he's viewed by the law of war, he's a civilian. This gets tricky. I'm sitting here comfortably in my own home in the United States. We're not being invaded, and my loved ones aren't being killed every day. So it's hard for me to say what a country like Ukraine should or should not do if they think that action will save their country and their fellow citizens. On the other hand, even if you like the person who carried it out and dislike the targets, a bomb attack in a cafe is terrorism. It's a moral and ethical question that folks are going to have to grapple with. I mean, many, many people are supportive of Ukraine repelling the Russian invasion, and understandably so. But will that same support translate to events like this? Again, though, it is far from clear who planned and coordinated this attack, and I am not convinced at this point that it was directed by the Ukrainian government. If anything, my money would be on an anti-war group inside of Russia, but we're going to have to wait and see for more information to come out. That's all I got for now. We'll see you all next time.